with us this morning, uh, whether you're here with us in person or watching on a live stream. We're just so glad that you decided to join us this morning. So just a couple of announcements for you before we get started. So registration, just please continue to register every Sunday. Um, that really helps us make sure that we're adhering to proper social distancing and just making sure we can have fit everyone comfortably here. So um, just make sure that you can continue to register every week. Um, and also for um, offering for giving, if you're interested in giving, um, please make sure that you just go online to lbchapel.org slash give. Um, you can give online or we still have a box in the back if you'd like to give um, a check or anything like that. So uh, just make sure that you are doing that as well. Um, and then just another update on our service schedule changes. So starting next week, September 13th, um, we're going to be moving the Lord's Supper service up to 8.30 um, while the worship team practices in here. And then we're going to be adding a 9.15 worship service, which is going to be exactly like the 11 o'clock service, except it's going to be masks required at that service specifically. Um, but the music is going to be the same. The preaching is going to be the same. Um, and then at the 11 o'clock, we're going to have our normal, you know, worship service here. That's going to be the live streamed service. Um, and that's also going to be the only one that Blast is going to be available at. So just make a note of that for next week. Also starting next week, we have our new series starting um, called Encounters with Jesus. Um, so that series is going to be brought to us at the 915 as well as the 11 o'clock. Um, so Nate is going to be bringing us our first message on the 13th, and then Mike Durney is going to be bringing us our message on the 20th. So be ready for that. All right, and then also on the 13th, it's going to be a busy Sunday here at the chapel, because um, we also have um, Aaron, our new worship and youth leader, also is going to be, the 13th is going to be his first Sunday with us as well. So, but um, promotion Sunday for Blast on the 13th. So on the 13th, Blast is going to be going back to its um, pre-COVID form. So the kids are going to be going back to a large group, small group form, as well as they're going to be checked in at 1045 and brought right into their classrooms. So starting next week, they won't, they won't start here with us. They will be checked in right at their rooms. Um, and just make sure that you're checking them in for whatever grade level they'd be at for the 2020-2021 school year. All right, and then on the 20th, we have our fall semester of life groups starting. So uh, go ahead and go on our website and check out all the groups that are going to be available. Um, there's going to be tons, you know, so whatever piques your interest. Um, if you are not currently a part of a life group, we really encourage you to join one. It's a really great way to get to know people and just create that really great fellowship. So go ahead and check that out. All right, so those are all of our announcements uh, this morning, so go ahead and bow your heads with me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us all here this morning, Lord. We thank you that we are here and we are able to worship you um, and praise you this morning, Lord. We thank you that George Johnson is able to be here with us this morning, Lord, to bring us a message from your word. I pray that you would bless him and open up his heart to your word and that our hearts would also be open to receive that word, Lord. So we thank you so much and we pray all that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Can we all stand with us so we can worship our Lord together this morning?
everything I need. Christ, my all. Christ, my all in all. My joy and my salvation. In this hope. Let this be a prayer this morning, church. I have decided. Let's sing it together. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, yes, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Christ is, Christ is enough.
was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled, he rolled the stone away. Sing it, church. I just pray that each heart is tuned and focused to you, and that we can worship you this morning without any other distractions. You 
search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i made it when it's all about you it's all about Okay, those of you that are in the room today, how many you just appreciate the worship and song you've just been a part of? I appreciate it so much. It's a blessing to be here. Uh, anytime I'm able to come from right down the street at Hope Church over here to Lakeside, it's a great, great blessing to be with you all. Thank you for the opportunity to open God's Word. Uh, that song has touched my heart deeply for many, many years. Uh, some of you probably know the history around that song. How Anybody remember the worship wars? Some think they may be still go be going on in the church, but anybody remember the worship wars as this contemporary Christian music was coming into the church? And I grew up with the great hymns of the faith and have great love of the hymns of the faith and the rich history we have. And there was a real war. How many know Satan comes to divide us? You know that? To destroy us, whatever he can use. Warning, warning, warning. The surveys say tech wars are the next new thing. Anybody notice that yet? What do we need all this technology in the church for? Uh, it's, the devil works to destroy, but in this case, a pastor was just really tired of all the wars over music, so he stopped it all, just took all the singing out, and for many, many months, their local congregation just spent time in the word and in prayer as they gathered with no more singing. He'd had enough, because at whichever camp you were in, the hymns camp or the newer music camp. Our hearts aren't right often if we're coming to church about wanting to get my thing rather than coming to church to lift up Jesus. Amen? Is there a little difference there? Whatever camp we might be in, and there's richness in both the newer and the older music. And then when all that music stopped, if you heard in the song, all faded away. It's coming back to the heart of worship. It was a song, the words that were put deep on this pastor's heart to bring back in to worship in their church getting back to what the heart of worship is. It's a beautiful song. Well, at Hope Church, uh, we've been going through what's the purpose of the church anyway throughout the summer months. I think at Lakeside here, you've had a similar experience. COVID-19 has been a challenging time. Uh, we did not worship in person for three months at Hope Church, and then limited worship, kind of like you're experiencing, with some starting to come out. I'd say about a quarter of our people are coming to worship, and three quarters are still watching the live stream. So it's a disconnected time. It's a challenging time. You throw on top of that the unrest in our city streets. There's concerns for justice and oppression, uh, not equality that we see in our nation. And then the violence is a real concern in our city streets that's happening all around our nation. It's a time of great tension. And anybody know there's kind of a hot election coming up? Anybody notice that? Everybody's on edge. So in the church, if remember the devil comes to divide us, whether it's over music styles or over tech or no tech or low tech or COVID-19, masks or no masks, and all the other things we argue about, uh, the justice, and we're for police. There's so many good and decent police, and yet there may be issues institutionally we're wrestling through as a country. Most of the evangelical Christians I talk to under systemic, understand systemic racism, if I say it to you this way, and I think you will too. 
that 40% of abortions in America today are black babies. 40%. While they're 13% of the population. And you say, oh, that's all the choice of people. But how about when the government pays for it? The government's promoting it. And all these things. There are problems. How many people know the Bible says the systems of this world are corrupt? They're evil. There's a whole new government coming one day with Jesus ruling and reigning forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. We're arguing about COVID-19, arguing about the justice issues. Uh, 94% of the protests are peaceful. Tragically, always people with other intentions come in to try to cause trouble, and we're seeing a lot of trouble too. Heartbreaking trouble on the city streets. And an election, as I said, that's hotly contested. So in my 30 years of ministry, this may be the most contentious time I've ever tried to lead a church with our elders as the time we're living in right now. So this summer, we just took a time out. Let's look back to how did the early church do church? Just as a show of hands, how many knew it was pretty tough in the first century to be a Christian and a part of a church? Somewhere between 50 and 100,000 lost their lives because they simply would not declare Caesar as Lord. They declared Jesus as Lord. They were burned at the stake, thrown to the lions, outcasts, imprisoned, harassed. Just read, uh, before you go to bed tonight, some light reading, Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame. You know this phrase is in Hebrews 11? The world wasn't worthy of them. You know what else it says about those saints who died? Sawed in two, thrown to the lions, tortured, persecuted, imprisoned, and killed. It said they knew this wasn't their home, I'm paraphrasing. They had their eyes set on a heavenly city. They knew they were pilgrims just passing through. But they were on a mission while they were pilgrims passing through. And that mission was to point people to God. So we took a time out this summer just to go through these couple of verses. Acts 2, uh, 41 and 42. And I asked Hope Church to memorize uh, Acts 2, uh, 41 and 42. And I challenge you to memorize them too as well. Remember the backstory. This is Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came, right? They all declared the wonders of God and they heard in their own language a miracle happened as the Spirit came down on Pentecost Sunday. Peter stood up and preached. He said, this same Jesus whom you Luke crucified is both Lord and Christ. They were cut to the heart. They didn't know what to do. What should we do to be saved? Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus and your sins will be forgiven. How many souls came to Christ after that first message Peter gave in the power of the Holy Spirit? 3,000 souls. They were, here it is now where we pick up Acts 2, 41. Those who accepted his message, I believe this is a formula we can follow in the church today as well. They accept the message. What's that? That Jesus died for your sins. You're a lost person in sin. Christ died to save you. Trust him. Believe him. Be baptized. Those who accepted the message, number one, were baptized, number two, and number three, they were added to the church. Accepted the message, were baptized, and they were added to that number. And now into verse 42. What did they do? Those people who had accepted the message of Jesus, they'd been baptized, they'd been added to the number of believers, they're part of the body of Christ. They devoted themselves, number one, to the apostles' teaching. Is the word of God central to your preaching here at Lakeside, to your teaching in your classes, to your home group ministries as well? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Number two, we spent several weeks on this as well. Koinonia in the Greek word is the fellowship. Now with COVID-19 now for six months, how many can't wait for a potluck at Lakeside again? Let me see your hands. I've been here. Your meal for the nations, phenomenal. Food from around the world, I love it. I love it. Hope we have coffee and cake often after services, celebrating and anniversaries and events special things. I miss coffee at the church. We don't even have that anymore. But it's more than coffee and cake. It's even more than a great potluck here at Lakeside. Koinonia is the sharing of life together. And I know you do it. When a member is hurting in this family of believers, you hurt with them. If they need help, you help them. I know you do. Your food pantry is not just blessing your people, it blesses people in the community. Many, many years you've faithfully been meeting needs. It's coming alongside the grieving, giving counsel to the one in need of, of advice from the Word of God, direction in their life. We share life together. They were devoted to the Scriptures. They shared life together. Three, the breaking of bread. And you have it here, biblically, by the way. You have it. 
every time you gather, right? It's at 8.30 a.m. next week. Don't miss the breaking of bread. It's what they practiced in the early church. As often as they gathered, remembering the broken body and the shed blood, and to prayer in Acts 2.42. That's the fourth pillar. The teachings of the apostles, the fellowship of the believers, the breaking of bread, and prayer. And prayer is where I'm going to land today at the conclusion of the service. We all know prayer is critical to the life of a believer. We know it's central. It's simply communicating with God. It's two-way. He speaks to us, and we speak to him. Show of hands. Anyone ever felt the conviction of sin in your life? God ever pointed anything out to you? A married man in the room sometimes uses your wife. God's pointed things out to you. He's communicating with you through his word, through his spirit, through the church, through teaching and preaching, through other Christian counselors in your life. But we speak to him, too, through prayer. So I'm going to break apart a prayer you know really, really well. It's the Lord's Prayer. It's one you may have known since you were a child. We often say the Lord's Prayer at Hope Church, not every week. I encourage you to say it verbatim, word for word. I challenge you to pray the Lord's Prayer every morning, noon and night, before you go to bed. Because if you remember, it's both in Matthew's Gospel, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, and it's in Luke's Gospel, many of the key elements of that prayer Jesus taught. You remember the disciples' question, right? Lord, can anyone finish the sentence for me? Teach us to... Pray. And he said, pray like this. And if you want to say it with me, you can join me. If not, you can just listen along. He said, and I'll do kind of an NIV version of the prayer with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name instead of thy name. But you can do it any way you're comfortable. Ready? He taught us these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we often add this conclusion. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. For how long? Forever. Amen. This is a little sermon I've often shared in devotionals at retirement centers, nursing homes, other settings. I had a dear lady, 98 years of age, make her way slowly up to me after this little sermon you're hearing today. And she said, Pastor, I think she called me Father, so you probably know her background. I've prayed the Lord's Prayer my whole life, hundreds of thousands of times, and I never really understood what was in there. So I just want to share a few pocketfuls of pee with you right now that I got from Dr. Elmer Towns, my theology teacher at Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary, to just try to break apart the elements of prayer that we find right here. And we'll do it very briefly, a couple minutes on each point. But first, I just share an illustration. There was a grandfather who uh, loved all week, looking forward to Sunday afternoon when his grandkids were going to come over after church for dinner. How many remember when you go to the older mother or older father's house Sunday afternoon? Some of you do. For dinner, it was a common practice in the church for many, many uh, generations. And uh, why is it that grandkids and grandparents are just so close? Have you ever thought about that? Anybody? There's a simple answer. They have a common enemy. So you can think <laughs> about that and get back to me later. But this grandpa... So loved his kids coming over. He'd save his change all week, and he'd uh, have a fistful of coins. So the first thing the grandkids would do when they ran into Grandpa's house is they would jump up to his lap. They'd start prying at his fingers. You know, he'd saved all the change all week. It was all going to be theirs, but they had this little game every week. So tell me, the little kids, three, four, five years old, it doesn't take long to figure this out. They love coming up to Grandpa and jumping in his lap and playing this little game to try to get the coins. Key question. What were the grandkids primarily looking forward to? What was grandpa really looking forward to? Having the kids in his lap and being close. I share that simple story I read a long time ago because it kind of summarized my prayer life as a little child and younger in faith. I kind of saw God as like maybe Santa Claus a little bit, and I came with you know, I want, I want, I want, and I, I need, I need, I need. And that was about all that my prayers were, very childlike, very simple. 
And yet, what does God want? An intimate relationship together, and prayer is a pathway to that. So the first little illustration I want you to think about, wherever your prayer life is today, in the Lord's Prayer, some call it the disciples' prayer, because they ask the question, teach us to pray. He outlines many different aspects of prayer. I ask you to pray the Lord's Prayer unapologetically every morning, noon, and night. Daniel prayed three times a day. Can we pray three times a day? Paul said pray without ceasing. Prayer was the heart of the early church in the difficult times in the first century they were living. They were a bold witness for Christ. The gospel may have gone to the globe. And you have people in this congregation from India. The Thomas tell us that the apostle Thomas may well have come in the first century to India. We know Paul made it to Rome. And many were saved even in Caesar's own household. I'm from what's the British Isles. It's believed the gospel made it with Roman soldiers all the way through Europe to the British Isles in the first century. Britain to India, Asia, Arab, Africa. The world heard the story of Jesus in the first century. It was miraculous. And prayer was at the heart of it. They were a praying people. They prayed as often as they gathered. House to house, they were praying and praising God continually. So in this prayer, Jesus teaches us, notice first of all, the person of God. The person of God. Right there in Matthew 6, 9a, the very first thing Jesus teaches us to pray is what? Our Father. Who are we talking to? Two of the three prayers Jesus prays from the cross start out with Abba. It's actually an affectionate term. Makes some of us, our deeper theologians, a little nervous if I say papa or daddy. But it's an affectionate term. And people from the tradition of the law, the Old Testament saints, you think about the mighty God, the God of law and justice, is a hard thing to think about coming to him like you would an affectionate father who you love. And so many people don't have that relationship. It's very challenging to think that way. Papa, daddy, that's the person we're praying to. Where is the place that he dwells? The place where God dwells. To think of a second P for just a moment. The place of God. And in Matthew 6, 9, just the very next phrase after our Father, are two words you know really well, in heaven. It's the place where God dwells. Jesus said he's going to prepare a place for us too, that we actually can dwell with God. The revelation tells us through the apostle John that he had a vision or a glimpse of the place where God dwells, the place Jesus is preparing for all of us to be forever with him, and it's a place with no more sin. Amen to that? More suffering, sorrow, even death has died. It's gone there. There's no more death. It's a place where he's our God and we're his people, living uninhibited by sin or separation. He is with us. That's our God, the Father we pray to. The place he is is in heaven. And notice the first part of the prayer that Jesus teaches us to lift up. I believe it's, it's praise. If you want to give a little heading to the different aspects of prayer we find here. Matthew 6, 9c. We see Jesus teaching on this. Hallowed be your name. If you come to God in heaven like your Father, in a loving and affectionate relationship and connection, and you come to him first, praise his name. I so appreciated the praises we were singing of God here today, lifting up Jesus. It was a beautiful way to start this service today. Spend time. How many kids in the room are looking forward to Halloween? Some practice it, some don't, so I don't know. But how many know October 31? Any, there's a big kid back there looking forward to candies. Um, how many remember the uh, Orthodox calendar of the church? Anybody? That October 31 was actually a, do you know this? A hallowed evening? Anybody in the room from an Orthodox background or a Catholic background? And we know why on earth would October 31 be a hallowed or a sacred or a holy evening? What happens in the historic calendar in the liturgical church on November 1st? Does anybody know what day it is? All Saints Day. All Saints Day. The night before for devout adherers to the religious tradition would fast that night. They wouldn't fill themselves with caramel and chocolates and all sorts of junk. They'd fast that night and pray, preparing for the All Saints Day celebration the next day where they remember the saints who have gone before. So if you're troubled with all of that, that's just out of history, church history. Uh, just think this. Think now. They're thinking about the dead, right? Do you get some of the spin-offs that are starting to happen now with Halloween? 
dressing like the dead, ghost spirits and all of that. We've come a long way from the origination here. But hallowed is a word we don't often use. So for the kids in the room, I just wanted you to think of that little story I shared. It actually hallowed. October 31 was a holy evening. Reformation Day as well. That's another fact of history. Absolutely. That was appropriate that it was put up on the, the posted that day, the theses. But it's a, so will you take time praising God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that he's holy. That he's holy mean he's entirely separate from us. He's holy other. When Jesus, we think about how holy he was on this earth, I often think of the sinlessness of Christ. But how about this? He was wholly dedicated to doing the will of the Father. And you've called to be holy too. That's what always troubled me. I know I'm not sinless. Christ died for my sins. I'm still confessing sin. I'm growing in faith, becoming stronger in faith, but I have a long way to go. Anybody just give a testimony here? You're not where you were when you first met Christ. You know you still have a long way to go, but you want to praise him and thank him for taking you somewhere. Anybody? He saved you. He's doing a work of sanctification in your life. He's making you holy. So as we think about his holiness and ours too, are you separated in your life to do God's will? Set apart to do his will. Jesus was, totally. So when we worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, take time just thinking how holy he is. In your prayer, express to him his holiness. Hallowed be your name. And next thing after the praise of God, I believe you see the program of God. The program, right there in chapter 6, verse 10a, the very next verse, the first phrase. Your kingdom come. Just a hand if you're ready for the king to return. Anybody? Your kingdom come. I ex short little political statement. I'm not picking any party, by the way. I'm just making a political statement. When the Democratic National Committee occurred a few weeks ago, they had a party platform, right? So if you elect Biden to lead, this is how he will rule if he's elected as president. There's a party platform. Are you familiar with that? The Democratic party platform. A week later, the RNC met for their convention, although it was all done virtually, and they too, if you elect Donald Trump to another term, the party platform of the Republican committee, this is how they'll rule. Read the Sermon on the Mount. This is my theological conviction. Matthew 6, 7, and 8. You'll see how Jesus rules when he reigns in our lives, in our marriages and families, in local assemblies. This is how Jesus rules. Let me tell you this. He rules best. Amen to that? Do you yearn for the king to come again? Jesus taught us to pray this way. I believe every day we're to be praying your kingdom come. After we praise him, we want his reign. And we want it in our lives as it is done in heaven. And the third little phrase on the first half of the prayer, I believe unveils the plan of God. And it's right there, the very next phrase in Matthew 6, 10, B, your will be done. Jesus isn't teaching us to pray that God's will would be done in our life. He modeled it, didn't he? Amen. Do you know or remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? If there's any other way, take this cup from me. We get the deity and the full divinity of Jesus. Amen. This is an Orthodox Christian church. I mean, you're solid on theology. How about his humanity? We strip trouble with that, don't we? Fully man while he was fully God. They're both true. And he, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But you know how he closed the prayer? Not my but your will be done. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father and went to the cross for you, for me. He had us in view. We're to wrestle out with our will. Anybody have a will that's sometimes different than God's will? You ever bang into that? Every day we need to pray this way. George Mueller, who I love, a mighty man of prayer, who rescued little children from the streets of England when homeless children were like the dogs on the streets. Ever read any Dickens, anybody? Dickens put a spotlight on the condition of the poor homeless children in the 1800s. And George Mueller opened orphanages around England and housed a couple thousand children. He was a man of great faith. He never told the need to anybody except God, a mighty man of prayer. Literally, there'd be no food to feed the children, and he would simply say, bow your heads. Let's give thanks. But there's no food in the kitchen. There's no food to serve the children. And he said, we're trusting God to supply the needs in a meat wagon would pull right up and there'd be extra supplies in the city that would be delivered to the children. He's such a mighty man of faith. Buildings were built 
all by faith. He was a mighty man of faith. And if George Mueller said this about his prayer life, it's certainly true for me. He said in his writings on prayer, 99.9% of my struggle is wrestling with my will and submitting it to God's will. Sometimes he said I'd pray a whole year about a ministry need, a personal need, a life need, a year in prayer on an issue, wrestling with my will and submitting it to God's will. And Jesus teaches us to pray, not only your kingdom come, but your will be done. We praise God. We want his program and him to come and rule and reign as the king. And we yield our very will, our lives to him completely. There's a hinge phrase in the prayer. As I understand the Lord's Prayer, it swings both ways. It's right there in uh, chapter 6, verse 10 in Matthew's Gospel, part C. On earth as it is in heaven. Do you see the two commas in the phrases that are above? So I just want you to think with me properly as the grammatic structure of the verse is outlined for us. It's correct to say, hallowed be your name here on earth in my life right now. As your name is hallowed in heaven. How many knew the name of God is being praised today in the heavens? The saints of old are around the throne room and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. The whole earth is filled with your glory. I'm, if I understand the revelation correctly, it's the prayers and praises around the throne room in heaven right now that will move God to come at the end of the age and end history because they're also praying this according to the revelation. How long, O oh Lord? How long? And I believe as I understand the revelation's teachings, it's the martyring the saints who are killed for the faith that at some point he will pull the curtain on history and say enough. There are prayers in the presence of God. Do we praise him and want our lives and our marriages and our families in this place of worship, this assembly, we, want, we pray every day that our praises would be here on this earth as you're being praised in heaven. Your program, King, come to this earth, rule and reign here in my heart, my life, my marriage, my family, this assembly, rule here as you're ruling in heaven. Why? Because God rules best. All of his creation who yield to him and worship him and want to serve him. And then your will be done. His will is being done in the heavens. Would your will be done here on this earth as it is in heaven? The last half of the prayer focuses on what I would call the us petitions because the first half is the old King James, I memorize this, thy kingdom, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But you, 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 we focus on God in the first half of the prayer. But Jesus teaches us to focus here too with these next last three petitions. And please notice it does not say Jesus did not teach us to say, me, me, me. He taught us to say, us, 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 all the way through the last half of this prayer. Because petition number one that's now focusing on this side of heaven, and you know right there in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, how about if we think about this petition in verse 11. The first us request, give us today our daily bread. How many of you have enough food to eat, even though COVID-19 has been going on? Do you have enough food to eat in your homes? Are you praying today for those who do not have their daily bread? If God has given you the ability, will you let your prayers move you to action and give resources? In your neighborhood, there may be laid off people that you could respect their dignity and try to do it even anonymously or as anonymously as possible to help people that are in need. Are you praying for your daily needs? And they're much more than food. That's just the beginning of of our daily needs. But this is our basic provisions, the needs of our everyday life. We're concerned about ours, we're concerned about our children, but let's not build more barns and bigger barns and other barns because Jesus even said our soul may be required of us tonight and that well, what will happen to all the things you hoarded? It's wise to plan for the future. What kind of a dad or a mom wouldn't be concerned for their children? We should prepare for our future. But I think for many in the material West, we have enough for 10 lifetimes already. Are we sharing? Are we praying first for others that have great daily needs? And are we sharing? Not only do we have daily needs, the next word is a word of pardon. And it's also in the plural us. Pardon in Matthew 6, 12. Right here in Matthew. Forgive us our debts. As we've also forgiven our debtors. When we prayed this prayer, I slipped in what word? The word 
forgive us our trespasses. We can forgive those who trespass against us. Another version we'll also hear is forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. You hear that prayer with all three phrases, and they're all right. There's actually six words in the Greek in the New Testament that relate to sin in some way. The word we use for sin is that you've missed the mark. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. I don't make it. I'm not righteous. Only Jesus is. So forgive me, Lord. I've missed the mark so many times. I keep sinning. Debt is what I owe God for what I've done. I can't pay that. An old hymn writer said, Jesus paid it all. Does anybody remember any of the old hymns? All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He did what? Washed it white as snow. You know the story Jesus told about the man, a working class man, who had a debt he could never pay. In ten lifetimes he was thrown into debtor's prison. Well, that's great because you'll never pay it off there either. You get a day wage a day for the little labor you do in prison. But this mighty Lord, not our God in heaven, but like a county powerful man, that small L Lord, feudal Lord, uh, he saw the poor man's condition and he forgave him of all the debt. And here's George's simple paraphrase of the story. The guy no sooner hits the street and he said, you owe me 10 bucks. He grabs the guy by the neck and he has him thrown in jail because he owes him a trifle small amount. The Lord, small L, was so distressed at what he saw. You wicked and ungrateful servant. I forgave you so much and you can't forgive so little. When we really think about our whole life of sin, the evil we've done, sins of commission, the good we haven't done, sins of omission. And Jesus even brought up the fact of our thoughts. Hatred, that's what leads to murder. Lust, that's what leads to adultery. We're sinners in our evil thoughts, in our evil actions, and even in the good we don't do. And even for a person who thinks they're a good person and maybe only commits one a day in each of those categories. I heard an old preacher say this a long time ago. In a year, 70 years of life, 70,000 sins. The reality is I sin much more than once a day. I might have hundreds of thousands of sins that I've committed against the Holy God. So will you join me in praying every day? Would you forgive us, Lord? I owe you what I can never pay. I've missed the mark so many times and I've crossed the line, right? Any hunters in the room when you have property and it says no trespassing, you want to hunt your own property. I've gone where I shouldn't go. I'm guilty. Jesus teaches us to pray every day, not just for us. What did Job do in the Old Testament? He was a mighty man of faith. He offered sacrifices to God every night for who? His kids. Any grandparents or parents in the room, are you praying for the faith of your children? Your grandchildren? I know they need to pray directly to him too, but you're interceding on their behalf. God, us, our sins. Does the sin of our nation grieve you today? I mean, to me, 60 plus million abortions is an offense to the God of life, the holy God. And I can bring up justice issues too. There's perversion in our courts. And I'll say white, black, brown, Asian, whatever the race is. It's a, just a fact it's better to be rich in America and guilty than poor and innocent. And I've seen it firsthand. There's, and see, you say, oh, you're a Democrat if you say this. Oh, I'm a Republican if I say this. I'm not in either camp. I'm in Jesus' camp, amen? And all the Old Testament prophets spoke up about the injustice in the land, the perversion of justice. The judges were perverted and bribes were being paid and the poor were being oppressed and God hated it. He hated it. The sin of our land. Do we cry out to God that we'll be forgiven as a people? And the hardest part of the prayer I haven't even touched. Help us to forgive those who are in debt to us. That have sinned against us. That have crossed the line with us. Do we not need God's help in that too? Every day. Help me forgive them. And it's the only part of the prayer. I believe there's eight or nine petitions depending on how you add them up in the Lord's Prayer, types of prayer. It's the only one Jesus repeats later. Just read a couple verses down in Matthew where he revisits this whole thing about forgiving others. It's a powerful part of the prayer. There's petition, there's pardon. The last little part of the prayer I believe here is protection. Protection. Every single day we should be praying according to Matthew 6, 13. Every single day, 
lead us, not just me, us, my people, our family, this local assembly. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And the King James, I believe, says just evil. The NIV brings out evil one. And I pray this prayer very simply three ways. Protect me from my own sinful self. I have enough temptation I face and struggle with. Protect me from myself. Would you deliver me from evil? Protect me from the evil inclinations within my own heart. Because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I said an hour earlier at Hope this morning, I don't need a, like to have Jesus maybe fix me up a little bit. I need a heart transplant. The heart of Christ in my heart. The righteous one imputed his righteousness to me. And I need to yield to him and submit to him. Protect me from myself. Protect me from the evil around me. There are people that want to bring harm to me or my family. There are people that want to bring harm to Hope Church, and it's true at Lakeside Bible too. Protect me. You know there are wolves in sheep's clothing? Right around us. Protect me from those that are intending evil. The evil one is ultimately behind it. And protect me from Satan himself. You pray every day for protection. You need to pray that way. That you be led out of temptation instead of giving in to temptation and that God would protect you. I believe he ends the prayer. It's added on maybe the second, third century. It's certainly a biblical concept, but the way we say it most often, I believe it ends with praise again in this grand conclusion. For yours is the kingdom. In the grand conclusion of the prayer, yours is the power, yours is the glory, forever and ever, amen. If you think about the kingdom, I'm trying to pray this prayer every morning as I'm driving to work, and if I get to Hayes Road, off of Hall, turning south. I know I'm just a mile and a half away to Hope Church. I want to spend a few minutes here thinking he's the king, not me. I mean, it's his church I'm serving. I'm one of the under-shepherds, one of the servants. He's the king. Don't forget that. How many in the room know God has the power to save you through Christ as you interact with him by faith, but he has the power to save you? Do you all agree with that? God has the power to save, to heal, to forgive. Why do I struggle so much with whatever is on my day list for Monday that I'm so worried about? I mean, COVID-19 is on the list. Unrest in our city streets is on the list. A big election is on the list. But all kinds of other trivial things, problems in my family, challenges in my marriage. You may have financial concerns. Why is it we trust him to save our soul, to forgive all our sins, to take us to heaven one day for eternity? But I can't trust him with a laundry problem my washer might have just gone out. The smaller problems we face every day. When you say he's the king, just worship him in that moment. Yield to him. Submit to him. Let him rule your life. When you say yours is the power, give him all the problems and challenges of your life. He has the prow- power to meet me in these challenges. Amen? If he can take you to heaven for eternity, he can help you through tonight and tomorrow. He will help you through tonight and tomorrow. Pray that way. It's your power. It's your power that saves me. It's your power that keeps me. It should be your power that will deliver me one day into the very presence of Christ for eternity. And what's the last part? Yours is the glory. One of the big problems, and we're ready to sing and pray at the end now, but one of the big problems, not just in the church, it's true in politics, it's true in business, and you can think of people in all those categories. When we get so big, so famous, so popular, so powerful, we get a lot of glory. Can we give all the glory to God? Let's pray that way every day for everything that we do. Let's pray. Father, we came to you in prayer today, starting out in ascribing glory and honor and praise to you. The worship team came and led us in song, expressing your great worth in our lives and in this world. We just acknowledge Jesus with the Father and the Spirit that you rule best. Take our lives. Cleanse us from sin now, I pray. And would you use us for your glory? I pray that like the early church, we be a gathering of people that pray. Pray every day. In all the ways you've taught us to pray, Jesus, then there will be a deep, intimate, and powerful connection with you and with each other as we gather to pray in your name. Take the church, Lakeside, Hope, here on Hayes Road, and your church universal and user for your glory, all the gatherings of your people, all the assemblies together, would you purify us and cleanse us and fill us with your spirit that we may serve you well in these challenging days for the glory of God the Father.
Sendo a Tassimocha. We serve a mighty and an awesome God. He never fails. Mm -hmm. 
see you guys again next Sunday. Thank you for coming and just remember that God is able. Keep your focus on him this week. Thank you for coming.